This programming is sponsored by Central Market, offering more than 100 varietals of globally grown and locally roasted coffees, including specialty in-house roasted beans, organic, and micro-lot choices from around the world. CentralMarket.com. This is Houston Matters. I'm Craig Cohen. Good morning. Coming up this hour, presidential historian John Meacham, another honor for a doctor behind immunotherapy and a centennial celebration of Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue. We start, though, with news that once again, the alleged gunman in the Santa Fe High School mass shooting has been declared incompetent to stand trial. Demetrios Pagortis has been in the North Texas State Hospital in Vernon since 2019. A judge in Galveston County last week, just like in four previous years, ordered him returned there for another 12 months to continue treatment. Galveston County DA Jack Rohde says he remains hopeful the defendant will one day be deemed competent to stand trial. How often do we see circumstances like this? Do some defendants go years, decades, their entire lives without ever being determined by a court to be mentally competent to stand trial? Let's discuss now with Dr. Jeff Temple, professor and psychologist at UT Health Houston, and David Kwok, associate professor and director of the Criminal Justice Institute at the University of Houston Law Center. Gentlemen, good morning. 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 Thank you so much for having us. Dr. Temple, let me start with you. Uh, and first of all, why was the alleged mass shooter committed to the hospital initially in 2019? Do we know? Uh, well, it j just, it's a very low bar in terms of, uh, of whether or not someone can stand trial. But in terms of whether or not someone needs treatment at a state hospital, my guess is uh, or, or what typically happens is a uh, level of psychosis, hallucinations, delusions, uh, unable to care for himself, uh, unable to understand his surroundings, the context, and in this case, what's going on in the court and uh, being able to assist his uh, legal team. And am I right that we often just don't know what those specifics are? Correct. Yeah, we, that is the case. And, and I know in this trial, and uh, uh, David can maybe speak more to this, but they are likely going to call in the uh, psychiatrist, psychologist from the treatment facility to get a little more information. Is that likely the case here? That's right. As time goes on, they, the court wants some assurance that they're making progress of some sort uh, because this is a criminal proceeding at this point. The defendant has not been convicted of anything. And so there is a sensitivity to this idea of having someone incapacitated in a mental institution while they haven't faced trial yet. What, what does the law require, David, in terms of mental competency for someone facing a criminal charge? For someone facing a criminal charge, they have to be sufficiently competent such that they can understand the charges, they can effectively work with their attorney to mount a defense or make intelligent decisions with guidance, of course, from the attorney about the proceedings. Is that different from someone facing a civil charge? Well, so civil doesn't normally require doesn't normally implicate incapacitation. But what's different in the civil context is that people can be civilly committed to an institution, which is entirely separate from a criminal proceeding. Mm. And so we have much more formal protections for criminal defendants because you have the weight of the legal system against you. Civil systems, we don't have the same history of legal protections. And so in some ways, it's, it's kind of surprising that civil incapacitation is actually perhaps easier than the criminal proceeding. Dr. Temple, what sort of psychological evaluation takes place in cases like this? It's comprehensive. So it's going to be uh, a battery of tests as well as continuous observations and clinical interpretation from, from meeting with the patient. And, and typically, you know, it, it is a really low bar in the sense that the person needs to be able to understand what's going on, the consequences, and be able to assist the defense team. And that really is, a, a, again, a pretty low bar. But, uh, but in this case, uh, and, and what your listeners might wonder is, can someone fake it or linger and, and that does happen but it's fairly rare because what what needs to happen is or what often happens is one legal team will say that the person is incompetent and then the uh, other the uh, other side will have their doctor review it and if both doctors say it or in this case the the state hospital says that the person is incompetent then there's not a whole lot they can do legally what what are the the you say there's a battery of tests what kinds of tests sure so there's personality tests uh, 
uh, uh, uh, things like the MMPI, which uh, what is that stand for? <laughs> Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, but okay. it's basically a uh, a long test that uh, is normed against people in the in, in the society that have those types of symptoms or have those types of disorders that you match up with the way you answer those questions. Uh, but it's not just that; it's a it's a comprehensive, not just a battery of tests like personality tests, but also observations and uh, continuous interviewing and the person you know just is uh, I, I don't know this particular case but delusional hallucinations and uh, you know disorganized thoughts might seem normal and then go into uh, uh, some hallucinatory uh, rambling David Kwok as I understand it the defendant's been declared both mentally incompetent and unable to assist in his own defense uh, what is the legal distinction between those two concepts so mental competency is a relatively broad concept over here. It could occur at many different times in this proceeding. So this is early, early on over here in terms of lack of mental competency. But as you might imagine, that, that affects broader issues in terms of how he's able to function in society. And so in the legal context, there's a lot of contention about what sort of treatments are allowable or are allowed to be forced on an individual. We can restore someone to competency, but that's different than, for example, saying that someone is a danger to society, which is a very different type of justification for why we force someone into treatment. Dr. Temple, how common is it for someone to be committed to a hospital for years, perhaps decades, with no apparent sign of improvement? Do, do we see circumstances like that? We, we do. I, I wouldn't say it's it's especially common, but uh, we we do uh, see that case. It was much more common in the late 1800s, early 1900s when we had a, a you know mental asylums and uh, and people who were just homeless or uh, you know had a, a normal sort of breakdown would end up there for life. But now there's much more uh, regulations around it and safeguards against doing that. So it's it's pretty rare, uh, but it does happen. David Kwok, what does the law say about such circumstances? I mean, theoretically, could this defendant or anyone continually determined to be incapable of mental competence to stand trial, could they simply never actually go to trial and spend the rest of their lives hospitalized? In the criminal system, there normally has to be a reasonable, right? So the, either the judge or the clinicians must be convinced there's a reasonable chance of success to remain in the, re, in the in the criminal system. But that doesn't foreclose the possibility that they may be sent over to the civil system for civil commitment, and that doesn't have the same type of requirement. That can be this open-ended process. Dr. Temple, does the, the mental health community itself, I mean, you mentioned asylums a century ago, and obviously things have changed drastically in, in all the decades since. Uh, but does it change its approach to diagnosing mental competence over time in such a fashion that someone who may be deemed incompetent to stand trial one year, you go a number of years down the line, nothing much has actually changed with that patient, but the expectations of the mental health community have changed in some way, and they might actually deem them competent. Do, do we see a situation like that? I think you could see the system evolve uh, in that way, especially in the last several decades. But I, I think we have a pretty good handle on what is considered mentally competent now and how to test for it and observe it. So I don't see that happening in, in this in this time period necessarily. But, uh, but we do have really good treatment for, despite the fact that it's been five years, we do have good treatment for uh, psychosis and, and other things. So there is uh, some confidence that we can restore, that the treatment providers can restore competency in people who have uh, been deemed incompetent. David Kwok, are there ever any uh, conversations within the legal community about whether the standards that have been established for determining mental competence should be revisited? There's a lot of discussion about kind of the spectrum of different types of mental illness, if you will, uh, because we've been focusing right now at the beginning of the process is the mental competency before any determination of guilt. But there's also questions about mental illness and whatnot, for example, decisions by a jury to determine that someone is not guilty by reason of insanity. And there's been a lot of fight in the legal world about, like, what does it mean? Because insanity in the legal world does not mean correspond nicely to what clinicians and science have to suggest. They have a role for jury, for lay people to determine. And so this is, this is an area of contention 
Uh, and also, oh, go ahead. I was just going to add to that that when we look at mental incompetency, if you if you get away from these high profile cases and things that misdemeanors and people are uh, said to be incompetent, then they are often not given the restorative uh, uh, treatment that they need and sent back onto the streets, and then end up doing something more dangerous and uh, and end up in the criminal justice system. So I think we need to have the, some of these structural changes that. Uh, prevent us or stop us from reacting to these things and get more into preventing them. And the, the misdemeanor situation, I think, thank you for bringing this up, is really important because oftentimes the punishment, if if someone were to go through and get charged with a misdemeanor, oftentimes the punishment is very mild, right? It's perhaps a small fine or a few days in jail or some type of effect. But if, if we go down the mental competency route, they can actually face much longer periods of incapacitation because of the treatment process. And so there's a very different societal values here that are at play when someone from mild traffic violation deals with this. And then I'll even throw in another another barrier is, uh, you know, our state hospitals are very underfunded and under-resourced. So even if we have effective treatments, sometimes those people that end up there don't get those effective treatments. Back to this particular case, uh, David Kwok, does the district attorney in this case have any other recourse other than to simply sit and wait? This is a waiting process. I mean, theoretically speaking, perhaps there could be negotiations going along. But again, if the person is not, the defendant is not right, mentally competent, it's an awkward situation to try to negotiate with their attorney about right, alternatives at this point. Which is really just terrible for the families and the survivors and the victims is, you know, I was thinking of on my way over here how when I wait to, you know, uh, I, I just recently accepted a new position and it was waiting for that to happen, how terrible what that was. And by magnet, obviously, inst- magnitude more is this people waiting for their justice and, and to see this perpetrator, a, a perpetrator. Uh, you know, have his or her day in court. And I imagine it, from a psychological perspective, it is just simply hard. And not that there could ever be a sense really of closure of something so horrific, but a sense of some forward momentum, something that says, well, okay, at least that happened. Absolutely. And I, and I think even if maybe they'd People don't receive the closure they they want or need. This waiting game is just terrible. This this being in this liminal stage is just a a, a really uncomfortable, terrible position to be in. Dr. Jeff Temple is a professor and psychologist at UT Health Houston. David Kwok is an associate professor and director of the Criminal Justice Institute at the University of Houston Law Center. Gentlemen, thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, presidential historian John Meacham. And later, another honor for an MD Anderson doctor behind immunotherapy. Stay with us as Houston Matters continues. This is Houston Matters. I'm Craig Cohen. During this election year, it is likely President Biden will use a familiar turn of phrase referencing this election, much like the last one, as a campaign for, quote, the soul of America. It's not just a phrase. It's also the title of a book. Presidential historian, biographer, and occasional Biden speechwriter John Meacham wrote in 2018. That's when I talked with him in front of a packed audience at downtown Houston's Christ Church Cathedral. Our conversation then included how some Americans upset with then-President Trump over his failure to decry white supremacy had become fond of suggesting Trump's behavior had, quote, never happened before. Meacham took exception to that. I think we have to beware of the narcissism of the present, the sense that everything that we experience is unprecedented because it forecloses the possibility of learning from the past and it dishonors, really. It certainly discounts the sacrifices, the uh, remarkable achievements of those who have led us to higher ground. So... When people say, and Craig's exactly right, when people say, oh, my God, it's never been like this, you know, tell it to John Lewis when he was concussed on the streets of Selma. You know, tell that to Rosa Parks when she was booked at the Montgomery City Police Department. Tell it to the three civil rights workers who were killed in Neshoba County. Tell it to gay Americans who only three years ago, not quite, were finally granted equal protection under the law. I think that Things have been incredibly difficult. 
That doesn't mean, because it's happened before, doesn't mean it's not happening now. This is not a message, relax, we've gotten through it. The message is, let's get to work because we've gotten through it. Let's talk about some examples uh, in our nation's history when this has happened before and we have gotten through it, we've navigated it and how that's happened. And then also what roles our leaders played or didn't play. And it's interesting because one of the things that you lay out is there are all kinds of examples of leaders stepping up and of leaders falling short. Oh, imperfection is the rule, not the exception, very clearly. One of the reasons I do what I do is the human drama of history is so fascinating. If they were uncomplicated figures, they would be less intriguing to write about and to engage. I had one president go down in my estimation when I did this and one go up. Woodrow Wilson, whoo. Wilson resegregated the federal government. He was a Democrat. That was the, the Democrats, of course, was the home of, of white uh, segregationists. He uh, curbed civil liberties in a historic way. If Donald Trump tried to do what Woodrow Wilson did, none of you would be here because you would be in the emergency room having your head treated because you would have set your hair on fire <laughs> before we got here. The burn units would be full. Crackdown of 400 newspapers. His attorney general makes Jeff Sessions look like Oliver Wendell Holmes. A. Mitchell Palmer, he launched raids without probable cause. Uh, he raided the homes of dissidents. Palmer's house had been bombed by an anarchist, but the anarchist, perhaps not surprisingly, had not planned very well, and so he blew himself up, which when you think about it, makes sense, because if you're an anarchist, you're probably not good at thinking things out. Uh, so, um, and that galvanized Palmer into these raids. So Wilson was, was a tough one for me to uh, get my, my head around. And the president who went up, in my estimation, was your fellow Texan, Lyndon Johnson, who decided on really the fact of his national election as vice president in 1960, he decided that he was no longer a senator from Texas. He was no longer had to represent the more reactionary elements in our native region as well. I'm, I'm, I'm from Tennessee. And he understood, too, the power of the office to do good. He once advised Ted Sorensen, uh, JFK's great speechwriter, that the president is a cannon, and we need the cannon to fire to lead us forward. The day he became president, after the assassination in Dallas, he called his aides into his bedroom in Washington. He changed his pajamas, he gotten in bed, and he's reeling off orders. He's telling them you know, who to call for the funeral, which foreign leaders to, to contact, all of that. And he said, in the midst of this, I'm going to pass the Civil Rights Act and not change a comma. And his political advisor said, well, let's think about that. The 1964 election was not a foreordained result. The reason Kennedy and Johnson were in Texas was partly because a young, a bright young Republican from Houston uh, who had come down here from Midland to go in the offshore business was going to challenge Ralph Yarborough in the next year. There was a split in the Democratic Party between Conley conservatives and Yarborough liberals, and that young Republican was George Herbert Walker Bush. John Tower had won the special election for Johnson's seat, and the idea of having two Republican senators from his own state drove Johnson to distraction. That was why they were here, was to mend the rift in the Democratic Party and make sure they held this seat, and they shored up the state for the Kennedy-Johnson ticket in 64. There was every reason to do some sort of mid middle of the road response on civil rights. But Johnson, something happened to him that day. And he realized he was the president of all the people and he was going to finish the work of Lincoln. And when people told him not to do it, he answered, well, what the hell is the presidency for if not to do the things that other men might not do? And that's, to me, a, a, an ennobling vision, and he made it a reality. I'm fully aware of all of Johnson's problems. My, my father was a, a veteran of the 4th Infantry Division, fought in play coup, never really recovered from it. I'm fully aware of the Vietnam uh, exception here. But we have to take our past as it is, not as we wish it to be. And I don't think we should denigrate his achievements on the domestic side because of the war. Again, imperfection being the rule. You uh, noted in the book that there really are two presidents who, in a way, transformed 
when they took office, LBJ being one, Harry Truman being the other. On the same issue, interestingly, uh, Truman was a uh, border state senator, as you know. He had Confederate ancestors who hated Lincoln, loved Lee. Uh, he used racial slurs in private all the way through. Truman lived forever. He lived for about 22 years or so after leaving the White House and thought that Dr. King was a communist stooge. Uh, so he was, he was a little uh, erratic toward the end. But he, too, when he became president on the 12th of April, 1945, and as he said, he felt as if the sun and the moon and all the stars had fallen on him. When he shows up at the White House, uh, when Eleanor Roosevelt summoned him uh, to tell him that FDR had died at Warm Springs, he said, is there anything I can do for you? And Mrs. Roosevelt, wonderfully, she's a heroine in this book, uh, said, well, is there anything we can do for you, for you are the one in trouble now? <laughs> uh, and that was true. I mean, imagine becoming president of the United States three weeks before the fall of Berlin. You'd have no idea how long the war in Japan will go on. You don't know much, if anything, about the atomic project. You might have to decide whether to use that bomb. You don't know if the damn thing's going to go off. You know, from, from, from our perspective, all of this is a, is a seamless narrative. But as my friend David McCullough likes to say, no one in the past walked around saying, my, isn't the past an interesting land? You know, <laughs> these were the challenges of, of their time, and they didn't know how it was going to work. Uh, Truman commissioned a very important report called To Secure These Rights, uh, the first major civil rights report uh, in American presidential history. He, uh, there's a wonderful moment where a Democratic National Committee woman from Alabama uh, was in the White House for a meeting, a luncheon. And she's, he, Truman had announced he was going to integrate the military. And this, this was leading to the Strom Thurmond break in the party. Uh, the 1948 election, for those who think that we've never been more divided, there were four candidates. There was Thomas Dewey, of course, the Republican nominee, Harry Truman, the Democratic nominee, Strom Thurmond, the Dixiecrat nominee, and Henry A. Wallace, the progressive nominee. So it would almost be as though if Somehow, if something had gone differently in the primaries in 16, it would have been as though Sanders was running as a third-party person, Secretary Clinton was running as the Democratic nominee, say uh, your senator or somebody was running as the Republican nominee, and then Thurman on the right if, as Trump. I mean, it was just this panoply of choices. It was a little like the Star Wars bar scene meets C-SPAN. Um, <laughs> but... What, what happens is Truman decides he's going to do this. Uh, he receives words about lynching. GIs were coming back and being lynched in Mississippi and South Carolina. A man in South Carolina who had just been discharged was leaving the discharge station in, I think it was Orangeburg, South Carolina, and was blinded by a policeman's billy club. Truman found that out and said, my God, I had no idea it was as bad as this. And he accepted something that drove, I think, the post-war civil rights movement, which was how can we project force around the world to defeat tyranny and tolerate it at home? Fundamentally, we, we can't do it. So, so, he's, so he's, he's made all these announcements, and he's in the White House, and this woman gets up, Mrs. Thomas, I think her name was, and says, can I go back to the South and say, you're for the white people just as much as you are for the black people? And Truman, wonderfully, Oh, here, uh, I've got a prop for you. Oh, there, well, thank you. Yes, very good. We do this. We, go, we do bar mitzvahs, too. Um, <laughs> he pulls out a constitution. Is this the constitution? Yeah. Yep. Uh, <laughs> and begins to read the Bill of Rights to her. An African-American White House steward is so amazed by this scene that he drops a cup of coffee on Truman because it's just so startling. The President of the United States starts reading out the Bill of Rights. And he puts it down and says, those rights apply to all Americans, not just white Americans, and I'm the president of all the people. It's unclear whether Ms. Thomas enjoyed that particular moment. Uh, when Truman re recalled the story in later years, he said, I just keep remembering that old woman's face when I read her those rights. But he also added, you know, it's not a bad thing to read those time and again, because it reminds us what we're really supposed to be doing. 
presidential historian and biographer John Meacham, talking with me in May of 2018 about his book, The Soul of America. Meacham's working on a new book about former President George H.W. Bush titled The Call to Serve, due to be published this summer. Just ahead, a key cancer development at MD Anderson has landed a doctor there in the National Inventors Hall of Fame. Details, the doctor and one of the patients his work has helped as Houston Matters continues. This is Houston Matters. I'm Craig Cohen. MD Anderson Cancer Center's Dr. James Allison is among this year's inductees into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. He's being so honored over his efforts to develop immunotherapy as a cancer treatment, work that garnered him a Nobel Prize in medicine in 2018. Immunotherapy stimulates the body's immune system to attack cancer cells. That's what it did for Ron Spidell, a retired canine officer in South Texas who was diagnosed with an aggressive form of bladder cancer. In 2022, he told Houston Matters' Michael Haggerty about it, beginning with what his doctor told him after Spidell endured eight weeks of chemotherapy and then surgery to remove his bladder. He sat down and he said, Ron, there's nothing more that we can do for you. There's no other treatments. You've had the harshest treatment that we can give you in the shortest period of time with chemo. And he said it didn't do any good. And he said further chemo treatment would just be useless. He said, so basically, I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but you have plus or minus six months to live. And it's going to be a very painful death. But then where did this sliver of hope come from of a clinical trial well it was a long ride from houston back to mission texas uh, and uh, a lot of discussions in the car and there basically we had a game plan of uh, starting to make arrangements for my death and get our affairs in order and then uh in april dr gal called and asked if i would be interested in a clinical trial and I said, well, absolutely. And I said, what is this? And he said, it's a clinical trial for immunotherapy. We're not sure how it will react with bladder cancer. And I received two drugs. And then in September of 2015, I had my last treatment and was released uh, from the chemical trough. And so what did that uh, drug, what did that trial do for you? Obviously, it's been more than six months. Yes. And... Uh, at that point, I kept telling the doctor that, you know, of course, all my scans just kept getting better and better and better through the trial. I was maintaining stable with my cancer. There was no more new growths. There was nothing expanding. Everything was shrinking or staying at the same size and going nowhere. Wow. How are you doing now? It's been a handful of years now. I'm seven years out. I'm still stable, very stable. And uh, ever since then, my blood works have all returned back to normal. Blood pressure, everything is back to normal. I mean, this is an absurd question or an obvious question, but I mean, what has it meant to you to have this treatment and to be given all these years uh, back? Well, as with any cancer patient, I'm living with cancer, but it's under control. And it definitely gives you a lot of hope that someday they will find a total cure. But if not every day, especially at a research institute like this in MD Anderson, these brilliant minds keep coming up with new and better ways to treat. And um, so it gives you a lot of hope that if something should come back in my body, that maybe there is something new out there now. The other thing it does, it gives you a quality of life, not just quantity. With chemotherapy, you don't always get quality. You may get a little quantity, but this is giving back quality. I'm as active now as I ever was at my age. I'm 70, and my wife and I still travel. We travel six months out of the year in the Airstream. We've gone all over the United States. We've probably put on about seventy-five to 80,000 miles traveling and experiencing new things. And I get to do that all with my wife. And that's a lot. 
cancer survivor Ron Spidell in 2022. That same year, MD Anderson launched a new institute devoted to immunotherapy treatment and research and named it after the man who led the charge developing, developing it, Dr. Jim Allison. Allison tells R. Michael Haggerty how it's become a fourth pillar in cancer treatment, but one that works differently from chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery. It doesn't directly target the cancer cell. Radiation, surgery, chemotherapy, all use uh, drugs that try to kill the tumor cell by directly interacting with it. What immunotherapy is, at least, is to get, the mo get your own immune system to attack your own cancer cells. And so the drug actually that... The, we were talking about here that the checkpoint uh, blockade was something that came out of basic science. Discovery. We discovered a molecule that actually stops immune responses and showed that if we disable that circuit in T cells, they would attack tumor cells sufficiently to get them rejected in mouse models, you know. And so then we took it gradually into human clinical trials and finally approval by the FDA in 2011. And it works. It's basically a way of just unleashing your own immune system to take care of the tumors. Because once you, the big difference is that when you alert the immune system to the presence of tumors, you develop T cells with specificity for them, and you've got them for the rest of your life. It's not like radiation or chemo that only you're killing when the drug is on board. What we do is that we give a drug that causes changes in the immune system, at least that part of it that's coming into contact with tumor cells and activates it so that you know, your own body can kill tumor cells. So obviously that could uh, help patients who uh, the cancer may return in some patients and they uh, would still have that, that ability, that response, that immune response ready to go. Yeah, and, that, and that's one hallmark of immunotherapies uh, that can't really be said for more conventional therapies in that it's regularly curative. For example, metastatic melanoma, when uh, we started on this work in 2011, when our drug was a, the first one of these was approved for metastatic melanoma. The median survival after diagnosis, you know, after a doctor said, oh, you've got metastatic melanoma, the median survival was seven months and fewer than 3% of people were alive at five years after, after that. But with the drug, the, the first drug of these, uh, it, 20, a little over 20% of patients are alive 10 years uh, in, in one big clinical trial, 20% of the patients were alive 10 years later. I mean, they're cured. And now we, it's not just 10 years, it's 15 now and 20 now for some of the people who are in the earliest trials. I know one of the plans for the Institute is to serve as sort of an innovation hub for, hub for researchers in the field to collaborate and accelerate progress in immunotherapy. I mean, how will that work and how will that be different than maybe how researchers typically work on this sort of thing? Well, what we want to do is, first of all, create an environment that people can collaborate. Typically, an institution is divided into departments, but you know, people work on different kinds of cancer and and they don't necessarily collaborate across those. Or people work in chemotherapy or radiotherapy, but they don't talk very much. And, and immunotherapy for the first time is, is one of these pillars that, that can be combined with the other one. So we need to break down those walls. And so the idea here is just to bring people together, not according to the kind of cancer they work on or the tools they use. And the scientists, uh, not necessarily according to whether they study the immune system or not, just bring people together. That A lot of it's based on my experience. When I first came up with the idea of targeting CTLA-4 to unleash T cells, it was 1995 when I first talked about it publicly and proposed to the cancer world. I mean, I was an immunologist. That this would be worth doing. It took three and a half years before anybody at a drug company was interested in helping us make the drug that we needed to go into the human trials. Nobody was interested. Three and a half years wasted. It could have been, you know. And so we're going to get. We're going to eliminate that that sort of way. The idea is just to have a stream of information with people from different fields working together. The idea being get stuff into the clinic as fast as possible, decide whether they've got any potential at curing, and then take them forward, try to interest drug companies eventually. Obviously, the, the field of immunotherapy for treating cancer has come a long way since you started working on it in 1995, but where do you hope this new institute takes it in the next 5, 10, 20 years from now? Well, I hope that within five years that we can get that survival rate 
Uh, we call it the tail, you know, if you plot survival, you know, it goes down. But most of the time it goes to close to zero for most cancer therapies. You can move it out. You can move the median out to 50% survival. But with immunotherapy, the beauty of it is that that survival curve flattens out at some point, 20, 30%, and lasts for decades. You know, I mean, those are the cured people. We want to raise that survival tail as high as we can get it in as many kinds of cancer by doing these these different combinations. And each time we have a success, that's going to accelerate the next one. And then um, the big one, of course, is to try to get cancers, lethal cancers that don't respond right now, such as glioblastoma and pancreatic cancer, to make some headway on, on those. Dr. James Allison, a Nobel Prize winning cancer researcher at MD Anderson Cancer Center, talking with R. Michael Haggerty in 2022. The National Inventors Hall of Fame is including Allison in its 2024 class of inductees for his efforts developing immunotherapy as a cancer treatment. And still to come, a centennial celebration of Gershwin as Houston Matters continues. A hundred years ago, next month, an audience in New York City heard George Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue for the very first time. It was a big deal as one of the first works to blend traditional classical music with this newfangled genre called jazz. This weekend, the Houston Symphony celebrates the centennial with a concert featuring Rhapsody in Blue and other Gershwin tunes performed by the Marcus Roberts Trio and vocalist Catherine Russell. Roberts, who's blind, tells Houston Matters' Joshua Zinn about being introduced to the piano and jazz. I was about three or four, or maybe five, and uh, I was at church one day and realized they had a piano. For some reason, I was interested in it. and. I only could play it for maybe three or four minutes before somebody said stop. Then there was an aunt who had a piano. I used to go to her house and try to play a little bit. But it was only until age eight that my parents actually bought a piano, which I had no idea they had done. And when I got home from school, I stumbled into it thinking it was like a piece of furniture that was in the way. So at first I was upset. And then I went around and I realized it was a piano. I could not believe it. I was self-taught for four years, and I finally started formal piano training at age 12. I had a teacher who taught at the Florida School for the Deaf and Blind in St. Augustine, Florida, Hubert Foster, and he was really my first piano teacher. And he taught me theory. He made me learn how to read Braille music, which I strongly tried not to do, but he forced me to do it, which I'm so grateful to him that he did. <laughs> And, you know, I did that, uh, obviously, all through middle school and high school. From there, I went to Florida State, and I studied with Leonidas Lupovetsky, who had studied with Rosina Levine at Juilliard, and he taught me a whole lot about sound and pedaling and just um, deeper aspects of the piano, things that you could do. So um, um, I was very fortunate to have those two really good teachers, and I don't know that I really took full advantage of what they were trying to teach me at the time, but... As the yeah. years have gone by, I've, I've understood what they were trying to show me. During this time, as you're as you're kind of learning the instrument and, and getting some of this formal training, what about the music? What what kind of music were you listening to? What kind of music were you interested in? Did you kind of have one genre you really liked, or did you just kind of you know do a little bit of everything? Well, when I got the piano at eight, one of the things that happened was I really did a lot of growing and developing on the piano at church because I actually started playing at the church that my parents went to. Like most kids, I was initially listening to the pop music on the radio, which was how we listened to music back then. <laughs> we didn't have YouTube or any of these things, Spotify, none of that. Stevie Wonder's music, uh, I was into that. Marvin Gaye's music, Earth, Wind and Fire, those things. At around 12 years old, I was actually looking for the All-Star game on the radio because I was a big baseball, big Cincinnati Reds fan back then. And I stumbled on to this radio station and they were playing jazz music, which I'd never heard before. And they had this show on called Swing Time. And it was a radio program where they played jazz. Louis Armstrong, I remember I heard some Duke Ellington. And I'd never heard those chords before. 
more. And of course, I was a pretty self-confident kid. I thought that everything I needed to know about the piano, that I had learned it on my own. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I heard those chords. I said, wait a minute, what are these chords? And I couldn't figure them out. So at that point, I realized that, well, maybe I didn't know everything. Maybe I need to uh, listen to the teachers and uh, <laughs> see if I can uh, apply some of their knowledge uh, to my playing. So at that point, I really got into jazz music a lot. And of course, like I said, I had to learn pro music. So I was learning Bach preludes and fugues and Beethoven sonatas. Uh, I don't know that I was playing them particularly well, but I was learning them. And it was a very inspirational period of my life. I also had another teacher who taught me saxophone and drums and stuff like that. So I was I was really into music a lot at that time. Just soaked up as much as I could. You're coming to Houston to perform uh, some Gershwin music. And, and obviously, you know, George Gershwin is kind of an interesting meeting point for classical and jazz a little bit. I, I'm curious, when when were you first exposed to Gershwin? Do you remember when you first kind of heard his music and, and what your impressions were? Well, I heard Rhapsody of Blue when I was a kid, probably 13 or 14. And at the time, I didn't know that that's what it was. I didn't know yeah. it was Rhapsody of Blue. And then I heard... I remember hearing the second movement of his piano concerto in F major and really liking it and not really knowing what it what that was about. It. And it was only later on that I realized, oh, that's what that was. <laughs> that was the uh, Chair to them, that was perhaps being blue. I was always attracted, as most jazz musicians are, to George Gershwin's themes. His themes are so perfect for jazz improvisation. They're full of soul and good rhythm. They naturally swing. And I think when I heard it originally, that was sort of what I thought. And, and I really uh, pursued hearing as much of his music as I could. And of course, he was a fantastic pianist. So I, I got recordings of a lot of the solo piano pieces that he did too. So he he's always been a favorite of mine and like I say, of um, many jazz musicians because of the the natural folk sound of his themes. Again, it sounds very American. It doesn't sound German or you know what I mean? It sounds like it was somebody who lived here in the United States. <laughs> so big fan. Yeah, of course. Well, and and so let, let's talk a little bit about Rhapsody in Blue, um, because this concert is sort of celebrating the 100th anniversary of its premiere. This is one of those pieces that is kind of renowned as a virtuosic piano showcase, right? I mean, the piano is, is so front and center with this piece. What specifically about this piece appeals to you, and, and what, what sorts of elements of this piece do you find that you're sort of drawn to as a pianist? Well, first of all, the fact that you could hear the jazz influences in the work. It was clear that he and Paul Whiteman wanted to bring those two worlds together as much as you could at that time. For me, I was attracted to it because I felt like there was more that could be done with the piece. And of course, it's fantastic on its own. And there are hundreds, if not thousands of uh, recorded versions of the piece. But I didn't think anybody had really dealt with Rhapsody in Blue based on an actual agenda of bringing it truly 100% into the jazz environment. So when I recorded it way back in 1995 or 96, that was one of the objectives I had was to bring it fully into the jazz landscape. Also, I was very interested in really having a situation where I could reimagine those piano cadences every time I would do it in a different way, based on it really being like a true improvisatory work. So when I play it, I'm drawing from everything I know about the piano, uh, and I'm wanting to bring that spontaneously 
using his thematic material to the piece. The second thing is when I play it with my trio, of course, now we're, we're able to take advantage of the hundred years of evolution of American music that's happened since Gershwin wrote it. So when you have Jason Marcellus on drums and, and uh, I have Martin Jaffe, very talented young bassist. When we have the two of them performing the piece with me, now we really do have the possibility of true jazz improvisation, group improvisation, where we're all making up what we spontaneously think of at that, at that moment, at that time. And we're able to collaborate with each other. But then as a group, we're collaborating with the symphony orchestra. So it's a really great opportunity to make room for both genres to be authentic and true to what they are, but also, like I say, to truly create something spur of the moment that's special for the audience. Yeah, well, and and like you say, you know, you you have your jazz trio, and and certainly, you know, the the trio I'm sure is is very used to kind of performing together in a space. But then, yeah, there is that added element of you guys are playing with a full symphony orchestra. Does that change at all how you think about the music or how you think about presenting the music, or or is it is it really kind of the same thing? You just happen to have more players with you. Uh, I think our main goal is to make sure that what we do it's really authentic so by that i simply mean that when we improvise on it that is what we're really doing so even when the orchestra's playing we're making up our part but we want to make sure that we don't disturb the conductor's ability to conduct his orchestra and we don't want to disturb the orchestra being able to play what's on the score so again it's a it's a true collaborative effort one of the problems in our country right now is that people don't want to listen to especially opposing views but the whole art of listening uh <laughs> is something that we could probably use more of uh, in our culture in music we have to do it we have to do it because for you to really know what to play you got to know what everybody else is wanting to do and you got to make room for it so that's really the essence of our democratic process and in jazz music that's one of the cornerstones of what makes the music great is that you have that balance of individual creativity and imagination, but it has to be put in a group context of cooperation and a common goal. So that's really what we aim for when we play this uh, wonderful piece with an orchestra. This is a concert that's really celebrating a lot of Gershwin. Uh, what else are you going to be performing uh, other than Rhapsody in Blue with the symphony? Well, we will be accompanying... One of our great jazz singers, Catherine Russell, she is absolutely fantastic, and she'll be singing some of Gershwin's most popular songs, like uh, uh, Our Love Is Here To Stay, Embrace of You, The Man I Love, you know, songs that are very appropriate for Valentine's Day, which is coming right up. So that's mainly what we'll be doing. And I, and I believe the orchestra will do a couple things on their own, like uh, they'll do An American in Paris, which is fantastic. So it, it, it should be a nice uh, well, range of Gershwin, and, and I'm sure there'll be something for everybody on the program. We heard pianist Marcus Roberts talking there with our Joshua Zinn. The Houston Symphony with the Marcus Roberts Trio and vocalist Catherine Russell performs Jazz, Love, and Gershwin this weekend at Jones Hall. And that will do it for today's show. The Houston Matters team includes Michael Haggerty, Joshua Zinn, Troy Schultz, Les Sherman, Garrett Bowman, and Brenda Valdivia. Jared Carroll's our technical director. 
On tomorrow's show, UH political analysts Beth Seamus and Brandon Roddinghouse join us to talk over developments in local, state, and national politics. Also, Michael Haggerty chats with Houston author Chris Kander, whose new novel is drawn from a traumatic event that happened to her when she was 19. Plus, last week, the Feed the Soul Foundation held a culinary conference here in Houston. The foundation provides guidance and financial support for black and Latino-owned businesses. Our Joshua Zinn learns more about that. I'm Craig Cohen. Join us tomorrow for those and other Houston Matters.